As we've talked about financial markets in the last two modules, we've emphasized the role of bonds and interest rates. And that's in part because bonds and interest rates play an important role in financial markets. But it's also in part because understanding bonds and interest rates helps us lay the foundation for some of what we're going to end up doing when we do macroeconomics. But of course, bonds aren't the only kinds of financial assets traded in financial markets. Another important class of financial assets is stocks. So I want to talk a little bit about the difference between stocks and bonds. Now a government can only issue bonds, it cannot issue stock. Because when an organization issues stock, the owners of that stock own part of that organization, and you can't own part of the government. But firms and corporations can issue both bonds and stocks. When they issue bonds, and you hold one of those bonds, it simply means that the corporation owes you money. They owe you those future payments that the bond promises. But if you own stock in the corporation, you own part of that corporation. And there are two ways that you can make money from stocks. The first is that you can collect dividends. Where dividends are just periodic payments to stockholders. The board of directors of the corporation will determine how big those dividends should be for each period. And they might be paid annually or twice a year or quarterly. Now the second way to make money by holding a stock is to cash in on the appreciation of the stock. If the stock increases in value, you can sell it at a higher price than what you paid for it and make a profit. So those two ways of making money on stocks implies a particular rate of return for stock investments, just as there is a rate of return for investing in bonds. And you might think that the law of one price should imply that the rate of return for holding bonds is the same as the rate of return for holding stocks. But that turns out not to be the case. And one of the reasons for that is that stocks are riskier. If a corporation goes bankrupt, then the first people to get paid are the bondholders, and only what's left over goes to the stockholders. We also know that stock prices fluctuate a lot. So how much you can get by cashing in on appreciation of stock depends on where you are in that fluctuation of the stock price. And the dividends aren't guaranteed. Boards of directors choose periodically what the next dividend will be. So that implies a greater risk to holding stocks versus bonds, which means there should be a compensating differential between the rate of return from a safe bond to the rate of return from a riskier stock. Now, historically, over the last 100 years or so, the real inflation-adjusted rate of return for bonds has been about 2% a year. That same real rate of return, inflation adjusted for stocks, has been more like 7 to 8% per year. So that implies what we call an equity premium. Stocks are equities in corporations. You own part of the corporation. And there's a premium to owning stocks in terms of the expected rate of return. It looks like that premium is about 5 or 6%. In some periods, it's been higher. Now, finance scholars have investigated that equity premium. And they've tried to see whether this large an equity premium is justified based on the additional risk you incur from owning stock. And they've largely concluded that while it can explain some of that difference, it can't explain all of it. That's what's given rise to what's called the equity premium puzzle. The puzzle as to why it is that the difference in the rate of return from holding stocks to bonds is as large as it is. We know part of it can be explained by the additional risk you incur from holding stocks versus bonds, but we can't explain all of it based on that. And so when we get together in class, We'll talk a little bit about what some of the causes for that equity premium puzzle might be, although it's not a fully resolved issue. It's an issue 
of ongoing research.